I want to start by saying thanks to Adam for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm very happy to do it, so thank you, Adam. And I really want to acknowledge a number of people who have supported me. I want to thank Mohammed, who is a deaf friend of mine from Indonesia, who has collaborated with me and given me a lot of support. Uh, and has helped with data and so on, all the deaf informants that I've had. I want to thank the Lever Hume Trust. They uh, enabled a three-year research fellowship. So I want to thank all of these participants in the work. So, this morning, the title of my presentation is Variation in Indian, Indonesian Sign Language, known as Bisindo. And I was interested in looking at it at two levels, the micro and macro levels. And certainly when I come to micro level, I'm talking about how individuals have adapted to variation. So there were two research questions for my project. And at the macro level, I was looking at negation, completion, interrogatives, finger smelling, and initialization. And at the micro level, we worked with four deaf individuals who were following the use of language in different areas and different social situations within Indonesia. But my focus for today is going to be on negation. So we're going to be looking at the macro level today. So my presentation will contain the following pieces of information you see on the screen. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Indonesia. I don't know if you know anything about Indonesia, where it is, how big it is. Before I arrived there, I had no idea where Indonesia was. I know, you know, I was told that actually Australian people don't even know where Indonesia is. They just think it's just Bali. But actually, it's big. Can you see the UK on my side? You see the UK? The UK actually isn't there. But I wanted to put it on the screen to actually show you the difference in the size of those countries. So one island, Java, and this is the sign, Java. Indonesia, well, if we go out to Indonesia itself, there are 240 million people, and half of them live in Java. And the first deaf school was set up in Java, and the Deaf Association, the Federation, was set up in Java, and it has the densest population. So, we would have felt that actually the sign language influence would be greatest from Java to the other islands. And people have gone to visit the school in Java, and then they would go back to their own island community. So the language would spread out throughout all of those islands. But actually, individuals were living very, very far from each other. So as it happened, within those communities, they developed and evolved their own variation of the sign language. And I think I've explained some of this information already on the slide. And it was interesting to know this, that actually sign language has been involved with education and so on since the 1950s. But it wasn't actually called that. It wasn't actually named until around 2000. There have been a number of publications looking at variation, looking in particular at one city, one urban area. And I think what we've seen is, and I'll talk a bit more about it, the convergence and divergence between what we would call isolates. And when one individual deaf person would meet another, they would understand each other, but they'd manage to adapt if there were certain next items they didn't understand and arrive at an understanding. 
My first work in Indonesia was to make a corpus of the information and data from two cities. One, Solo, and the other, Makassar. You'll see them on the screen. And we identified 17 individuals in Solo and 26 in Makassar. And we had the setup where people would sit and chat to each other, and I filmed that. And I was focusing my investigation on negation and completion. So, you see on the screen, there are manual and non-manual factors affecting negation. But most strongly, I think we see it's the manual factor. Very little identification of non-manual features. Very often, you will see uh, a head, a head remaining stable, not moving, and sometimes we would see that as a negative. But in Asian countries, it's a very, very dominant, pervasive factor is the manual feature for negation. I want to look a bit more at the words identified on the screen in red. But let me start with three negative particles. This, this, and this. And I think yesterday Elizabeth was talking about the palm up feature. So we have a link there with my presentation today. But the most prevalent is this one, very clearly. But it comes from uh, hearing culture. And I saw hearing people use this all the time. I lived in Indonesia for two years, and I would often communicate with hearing people. And I saw this hand shape many, many times, used by hearing people. It has many functions. You can see them outlined on the screen. A very basic no negation, or cannot, or it's not there. So that hand shape can represent all of these types of negation. And we see also some kind of a symmetry. It has a, fun it has a heavy functional load covering all of these various items. So for example, this would show negative existence. If you look at the person on the right, person in blue, okay, look out for that. So that, you will see the example. And using the Indonesian vocabulary accompanied that sign. We see also that mouthing is quite important here. And that enables us to focus down. And the example, the earlier clip, you would have seen the mouthing that occurred, which showed negative existence. Tikada. You'll see that mouth pattern that was used in conjunction with that sign. And what is interesting, there was a publication by Hohenberger, and he was quite resistant to identifying function as part of mouthing. But uh, I think it does have connection. I think what was interesting as well to see is that mouthing can actually reduce. We can have an extreme where you see full mouthing, and then on the spectrum, on the continuum, you can only see the predicate. And I think a lot of that is to do, for example, with language contact, as I said, working with hearing people, and we see that mouthing actually reduced there. <coughs> From titakada, reduced down to ada, even. And deaf people have seen hearing people reduce the mouth pattern and have copied that, imitated that. But of course, we, as deaf people, don't identify the sound 
but we can see the Adda. But deaf people are pretty clever at language use because they know that the handshape is giving them a negative and they know the predicate is there on the Maori. It's quite clear. Deaf people are very efficient. So, the example now I'm going to show you is this handshake. And this also shows negative existence. <coughs> Both of these participants use this handshake. So you'll have seen both of these individuals use that handshake very clearly. In Makassar and Solo, when we compare the two forms of negative existence, what do we see? We see Solo uses both of those handshakes. In Makassar, they use this handshake. There's no use of the second sign in Makassar. But we do see layering. It may well have been that people have used one sign in the past, but now there's this new sign. So the function of that alone is reduced. So we see this grammaticalization process. Uh, I explained a little bit about particles, but what we see that particles can be criticized. And I'll explain that. So if we see the critic and the predicate, we see them much more closely aligned together. And we actually see a climb for grammaticalization. So we see that the particle is a full phonological word. And then on the continuum, we see this leaning, this climb towards the predicate. So how do we identify these? One might be a process of assimilation <coughs> with the location of a previous sign. And the sign is utilized in the same location. But also there may be a possible phonological segment which is deleted. I want to show you this example. If we <coughs> compare a free form, not a clitic, let's look at this first. Look at the person on the right. You see that? Meaning, don't know. There is no assimilation there. And this example, you actually see them assimilate. So it's a proclitic. The predicate comes before. So for again, the example, we see location assimilation, assimilation. It's located elsewhere. So if you look for that, So you see the location is altered and the signs are combined, they're assimilated. One more example. C. Here we have doubling. Look at the person on the right. This is how they produce the sign. They produced it near to the eye, so it's become assimilated. So let's move on from critics and look at negative suppletus. 
completion. I'm going to use the sign for completion. And what it means is that there is regular semantic correlation, but not necessarily regular formal correlation. So, for example, one book, two books with the S. One child, two childs. No, you don't have two childs. You have two children. So, that is an example of suppletion term, children. So it doesn't necessarily correlate in terms of form. Sign languages are, of course, very different, but all of them have negative suppletion. But if the predicates are high frequency, so for example in BSL, the sign, wait, wait, wait a minute, in BSL, British Sign Language, you would use the head to head shake, so go and then the head shake, don't go, want, Head shake, don't want. Have, head shake, don't have. Or you can have this sign, which also means don't have. So that's negative suppletion. But when we look at the literature, sign languages like BSL, British Sign Language, have both of those signs, but that's the only option. Or perhaps this form of negation. So, uh, yes, well, there are a number of different types, but you can't use this form of a negation. So there are things that we know. So it's quite clear what negative suppletion is within that sign language. We have other examples from Catalonia, for example. And you see that from foul and you can't have a negative particle and you can't have a head shake you have to have a suppletive in Catalan sign language my problem of course with Indonesian sign language was that there were negative suppletions but they could also be regular negatives regular negation so how can we defend that argument if we know that it's negative suppletion there, we have three pieces of evidence. And I'm going to use the example with the term tidak, quat, and it means not strong. First, we have an antonym, which is weak. But the form is different. The meaning might be similar, but the form is different. Deaf people themselves use a lot of mouthing. Titak quat, you see it. But it will indicate what it means. Titak quat. We see if we add this, the handshake, it doesn't give it a positive meaning. I asked my deaf informers, can you use the signs in this way? And they were very clear that you couldn't. So we see very clearly then in the work that this is a negative suppletion. There are a number of negative suppletives within Indonesian sign language, as you see on the screen. I think I'll show you three examples in the bottom row. The first is a positive predicate. Ava. And this is the negative. You can do it this way. Can is this. Cannot is this. To know a person is this. Or negative is that. Cannot. I used some arbitral analysis to identify whether you would choose a suppletive or some other strategy. And what we see is uh, there are two important factors, uh, both region and age. 
in solo, uh, you see the use much more than you would in makasal. And if we look at age, the older a person is, the less they would use negative subletive. So you see this language change to more subletion. So Verna says that subletion can help a language support a language. It's easy to remember, if you like. It's very easily identified and retrieved from where it is stored. And this is my top nine predicates by frequency. And that shows which strategy is being used, whether it's a particle or a clitic. Or the sign is used with mounting and the subpoena. So you can see <coughs> the strategies here on the screen and the differences. And one reason I love Indonesian sign language is this wonderful variation. There are so many different strategies in their grammatical system. So these are possible. And we see this uh, reduplication. And we can see that there's not this dependence on one, but there is allocation across these different forms. So, the corpus that I worked on uh, has been expanded. We have included four more cities. First is Padang. And the second is Pontianak. And then Singaraja, which is Bali. That's on the east of Indonesia. And then we have Ambon on the east. So, it's not here. The sign here is the sign for Ambon, so Ambon is not here. So I'm going to change the sign and point in another direction. I'm now going to use that sign for Ambon. So we now have included 132 participants. We've looked at the negation, completion, and we're going on to interrogatives and alphabet. And I'm a happy bunny. Why? I have all these new things. I found a new negative particle. I'm very happy. What is it? This is my new negative particle. So, for example, if we look at Pontianak, look at the person on the left with the red top. And they're talking about washing clothes in a washing machine. And at the end, you'll see this handshake. Okay? Do you see it? So this is an example of negative existence. No noise is what she was saying. And I went to a cafe and I ordered something and they said the drink wasn't there. And this was a hearing person. A hearing person was using that gesture to tell me they didn't have something. So that's now been incorporated within Pontianak sign language variety. Hearing people use that for negative existence as well there. So that's function one. If I went to Singaraja, same thing happened again. So, you see 
that hand shape is used quite a lot. But it also has many functions. It's not only negative existence. So, I was in the hotel and I had a problem. The shower had broken and it was a pain in the neck. It was very hot and I needed a shower. So I had to get the guy from the hotel to come and fix it. And unfortunately, they couldn't fix it. But it was positive because he came out of the bathroom and he said to me, <laughs> and it was just perfect, it was perfect to actually identify yet another hearing person using that handshake. So the function is clearly oh, wide open. So why do we think we're using that? I have a theory which I can't prove, but you may know that, uh, as I said, that handshake is used quite a lot in India and Pakistan. I see that a lot, or we've seen that a lot. But um, way back to 400, well, 1400, we see the expansion of Hinduism throughout Southeast Asia. And we see Singaraja and Pontianak there. Is it possible that gesture came from there, the spread of Hinduism? And it may well be that they assimilated it, copied it. I don't, I don't know. I haven't read up about that yet. But if any of you know anything about that, then please share that information with me. Please let me know if you know it. And also, Indonesian language has loan words from Sanskrit. So, for example, Singaraja, the combination of the letters in there, actually has two words. It means Singa, lion, and Raja, king. So there's some kind of linguistic um, loan potentially in there. If there is in spoken language, is it possible we have that loan from sign language too, or gestures? Okay, so now I'm off to Ambon. Remember, it's not here, it's over there. You see? One more example. I don't want. I don't want. Okay, so we see we have that and we see it in the hearing community. But where's the gestures there? It's funny, isn't it? Where's it come from? I went to a deaf school and uh, I asked that kind of a question there. And one person said, oh yes, there was one deaf person went to a school library, took out a dictionary of Indian sign language, and they have it. Some kind, good-hearted person had given the school all these sign language dictionaries from different parts of the world, and one person was looking at the Indian sign language dictionary and thought, oh, I like that sign. I'm going to use that. And that person, top left, when I looked at the corpus and I was trying to see who was using that and I identified the individuals who used that and there are seven people I identified using that. They're all his friends and they were at the same school together and they shared the same religion which was interesting. They're all Christian and the others are Muslim. So that was interesting. So it's possibly uh, important, the reliance on the social network. So we now have six areas, and I'm showing you where these handshapes are used in different parts of Indonesia. So negative existence and possession can be used in three areas, as you see on the screen. In Pontianak, 
in Sanaja. They have all three varieties. In Makassar, just one. Why? It may be linked with, I mean, for example, in Java, there are so many, many people. There's a really strong, vibrant deaf community. Ideas develop, ideas are shared. But in Makassar, it's much more quiet, rural, people are isolated. So maybe there's a link to that. I don't know, I haven't really looked into that and researched that yet. So, in conclusion, first, if we look at form and function, it's quite complex. And the definition of subletion, I think, can expand it a little bit. And we see evidence of grammaticalization. And we see the potential for possible layering and specialization. We do have some questions about the spread of gestures, how that's happened. Maybe you know things that you can share with me. And finally, looking at the role of social networks, I really would like to look a little more into that and how we can best move forward on researching that kind of sociolinguistic typology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interpreters. Thank you for the note takers. And uh, I have a book, which I'm going to publish soon. Thank you. <laughs>